Hello, this presentation is about modeling in SAFIR of concrete voided slabs in a fire situation. I want to acknowledge contributions from co-workers of Bureau d'études Delta GC, which is the design office of Jean-François Cadorin, the author of the software Ozone. What is a voided slab? This is a concrete slab where the lower flange is normally made of precast pre-slabs, which are propped, and on which some insulating blocks are located to make the slab lighter when the in-situ concrete has been applied. And this in-situ concrete creates some rips in two perpendicular directions in between the blocks. And on top of the blocks, you have the continuous upper flange of the slab. You see here some transversal sections where you can see the shear bars, which are in one direction. This is the transversal section where you can see the insulating blocks in this project 400 by 400 by 180 cubic millimeters. And you see that in this project, we had two different thickness of the slabs in different parts of the building. Here is the longitudinal section where you see these bars which belong to the pre-slab. Because we had two different plan views at different floors with two different fire resistance requirement. As we said, we had two different thicknesses of the slabs. The rebars are arranged differently in different places of the building, essentially because we have different loads in different zones. And we have various supports, uh, some linear supports made of shear walls and some point supports made of columns. So that's why parts of the slabs are voided, but parts are flat slab nearly around the columns where insulating blocks are not located to increase the capacity with respect to shear punching. So it was obviously impossible to make a model of the whole building, which was so complex. So the strategy which was decided with the authorities was that first one experimental test would be made, representing supposedly the worst case possibility to check uh, against some failure modes which cannot be modeled, like spalling or why not explosion of the lower flange when the insulating blocks would melt, why not? all uh, different problems of integrity. A model would be made in SAFIR and validated against that test. And then we would make two SAFIR models, each one representing a critical part of one of the floors. This is the plan view of the test with uh, the two linear supports. This is the typical uh, European furnace test, three meters by four. You see the insulating blocks and in some parts around the edges, there is no insulating block. So here a picture where you see the pre-slab and some bars on the pre-slab. You see here when the insulating blocks have been installed and here some additional rebars which will be in the upper flange of the slab here ready to be concreted. And this shows the specimen from above with the two lines of load to create a four lines bending. The SAFIR model will combine a grid of perpendicular beams, as we will see, and shell elements, the shell elements in the parts of the slab, which is a flat slab. Thermal flow in the shells is uniaxial, so there is nothing worth mentioning. The section of the beams would be like this. Each beam finite element would have a section which is an H section, where here you can recognize the rib which is between two insulating blocks, one half here, one half there. So each beam finite element would represent a rib between two insulating blocks. There are some approximations in that model. First of all, the polystyrene blocks are supposed to be gone from the beginning, so the cavities are, are present from the beginning of the simulation. And of course, the thermal model is 2D because it is supposed to be used in a beam element, whereas we know that cavities are in fact 3D. If we look at the comparison between the 
temperature computed by Safir and the temperatures measured during the test, the agreement is nearly perfect at the level of the lower rebars, which is particularly critical. It is quite good here at the lower part of the cavity, also quite good at the upper part of the cavity, and correct as well in the upper rebars. And if we look at the temperature on the upper surface of the slab, critical for the insulating criteria, the agreement is nearly perfect and we see there is no problem of insulation criteria. So this is the SAFIR model of one quarter of the specimen for symmetry reasons, where you see different beam finite elements and few shell finite elements. And here you see that these beam finite elements are typically the I section, but some are made of a C section, for example here on the axis of symmetry or here where the rib meets the shells and we don't want any concrete to be taken twice. This is the bending moment distribution at room temperature where we observe essentially a one-way bending as we could expect. But uh, during the fire, here at uh, the end of the simulation, we have a bending moment also in the transverse direction with some jump, some steps in the moment, which indicate uh, some torsion moment in the longitudinal ribs. The deflection curve here from the test and here calculated by Saphir, we see the same trend, failure uh, appears a little bit later than the end of the test. We have displacements which are a little bit bigger than in the test, but it has to be mentioned that the simulation has been made with the characteristic value of the material strength. If we increase the strength of the bars from 500 to 600 megapascal, then we get the yellow curve. We didn't play with the concrete strength. Uh, to get exactly the, the, the match with, with the test that wouldn't make sense. We are quite satisfied with the trend we have and we observe that the simulation yields results on the safe side when we use characteristic values on, of the strength. So these are the ones we are going to use for the project. In the project we have two typical uh, parts, let's say. This one was identified schematically speaking, of course, between two lines of support, two shear walls with, with in between a grid of columns. And we modeled one slab panel here between four columns. This is the model seen from above with some I sections and uh, C sections as explained and at the boundary of the model where we had symmetry reasons. And also uh, rectangular sections here, for example, in between two pre-slabs and on the joint, there is no uh, polystyrene insulating block. This is the Saphir model. And uh, you see that the shell elements contain a lot of different uh, element types. This is because the arrangement of the rebars uh, around the support is quite complex and we wanted to tune it as closely as possible. There is an approximation uh, in between two pre-slabs. There is a discontinuity. So the longitudinal rebars which are in the pre-slabs cannot uh, go from one slab to the other. So the, the, the gap is bridged by some additional bars represented in red here, which ensure a transition of the tensile force from one pre-slab to the other. We decided not to represent the discontinuity in the model. And this was based on two assumptions. First one was that the designers had done the job properly for room temperature and that there is enough steel here, the arrangement is sufficient to transfer the tra tensile force at room temperature. And if this is the case at room temperature, this is even more the case in the fire situation because these bars are colder than this one. This is the result of the simulation, which we stopped after three hours, where a requirement of two hours was at that, in that zone. We had, a, after two hours, a displacement of L over 44, so no indication of failure. This is the displaced shape of the slab after three hours, where you can see a double curvature. 
This is the bending moment distribution in the ribs where you can see hogging, sagging, hogging, as you would expect. But uh, in the fire situation, after three hours, the bending moment distribution is different. We have essentially hogging uh, all over the place. These are the actual forces in the ribs, quite low at room temperature. But uh, after three hours, we see some kind of tensile membrane action developing in the center with compression around this central zone. There was another part of the building where the plant view was different. Schematically speaking, we had a rectangle on uh, shear walls and here one column support. So we modeled half of this structure for symmetry reasons again. Here the plan view where you see this combination of I sections, C sections and even rectangular sections here in between two pre-slabs. And here the shell finite element around the column. This is the Saphir model with again complicated complex pre-bar arrangement here. This is the displacement curve we get by Saphir, where the simulation stopped after a little bit more than two hours by compression problems in the slab around the column. And if you look at the displacement shape, you can see here some uh, hogging and you can understand that the lower parts of the shell finite elements which are in compression and which are heated may undergo some problems at a certain stage. This is the bending moment distribution at room temperature. The same distribution at the end of the simulation. Actual forces here, you see that they change constantly during the fire. And this shows that you need a very good and very robust uh, concrete constitutive model in the software because all these points of integration go from tension to compression or compression to tension and vice versa and back again temperature so building such a model is not so trivial we know that shear punching is not verified by the numerical models but like some other failure modes uh, integrity failure for example but for shear punching at least Saphir gives you the evolution of the reaction on the column which you can use together with the evolution of temperatures in concrete and in the bars. So applying a simple model in which you reduce the thickness of the slab according, for example, to the 500 degrees isotherm and taking into account the reduction of strength in the bars, you could get an estimation of the shear punching capacity. Uh, I wrote on the previous slide that Saphir gives you the evolution of the reaction. Is that really the case? Well, for this model, which we modeled at least half of it, yeah, we, we got exactly the reaction uh, in the column. In fact, in, in our model, we have half the reaction of the column, of course. So that's okay. But in this other model, where we modeled only this slab panel with symmetry boundary conditions, these supports are ignored, in fact, and, and, and the increase of compression, which you would have, I would guess essentially on the first and the last column in this direction is not represented in this model here. So we take we should take a, maybe a little bit higher safety margin in this situation. So as a conclusion, the thermal behavior of voided slabs could be modeled with 2D cavities, which are present from the beginning of the simulation. The discontinuities between the pre-slabs have not been represented. A grid of beam elements was used to model the ribs between the insulating blocks, whereas shell finite elements were used to represent the parts of the models where we have a flat slab. Beam and shell elements can be, can be combined in a model, we knew that, but in most models we had seen up to now, the, the shell elements were used to represent the concrete slab on top of steel profiles represented by beam elements. Here, the shell and the beam uh, elements are at the same level. And what is not represented in the model are spalling, shear punching, and integrity failures, of course. So I thank you with that. And if you look at this presentation before, 
before June 2024. This is the time in June where we will have the next Structures in Fire conference in Coimbra. And if you watch this presentation after June 2024, you can download the proceedings of the conference on the website of Structures in Fire. Thank you very much.